hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of breaking up a little bit. Oh. Oh, thank God. I thought it was just me. Oh, I'm sorry. It could be my internet being a little unstable. We'll just do our best. So we're coming back. We've hopefully paused and you took some time to think about um, the differences between bond, so between bond energies and enthalpies of formation and try to think about what each is representing. So Marissa, do you want to start sharing out whatever your team noticed, maybe one thing? Um, what me and my group thought was the key notice is that energy diagram one is that they're all in the gas phase, while in energy diagram two, there's multiple phases like solid and gas. So that's, yeah, that's really important to notice. Bond association energies or bond energies are only measured for gas phase reactions. So if you got a problem on an exam and the problem said find the enthalpy of reaction for something like this that has a solid and gases, you would not be able to use bond energies. These are only measured in the gas phase. So that's super important. Here there's I'll just write things that we're noticing. You can have gas, liquid, and solid phase. And one thing to notice too is look here guys, H2O gas is different and the enthalpy of formation for H2O liquid. So that's interesting to think about. Why are they different? Jasmine, what about your team? Um, so Paula mentioned how um, all the bond dissociation energies were positive, and then all the enthalpy of formations were negative, and then um, that has to do with there's energy required to to um, form the bond. Wait, no, hold on. Am I saying, no, no. Energy required to break the bond, so that's why the bond association energy is positive, and then the enthalpy of formation, they're negative because energy comes out when you form the bond. Nice. I'm just trying to get what you said. So that's a really important observation. Always the bond dissociation energy or the bond energy is positive. And like you said, Jasmine, that's because they're, what they're measuring is the energy it takes to break bonds. And bond breaking always takes energy, always requires energy. So guys, is bond breaking endo or exothermic? Endothermic? No, yes. Okay. <laughs> so they're always positive. Hello. And that's why you always have to think in your energy diagram, are you talking about the direction of bond breaking or are you talking about the direction of bond making? And that is going to affect the sign. And then Jasmine, it sounded like you all noticed that the enthalpies of formation are mostly negative. So I'm going to add that to things we notice. They're almost always negative. Almost always negative. What are the zeros? Did you guys notice any pattern in what's zero here? And they're on the elemental front. Did someone say something? Yeah, they're on their elemental form. It's just, I think they're the most stable form. The, right, the zero of potential energy is for elements. So H2, that's hydrogen in its elemental form, oxygen in its elemental form, 
Carbon graphite, this is the most stable form of carbon as opposed to diamond, zero. And magnesium solid, that's just magnesium metal, it's an elemental form. So anytime you have elements in their most stable form, the enthalpy of formation is going to equal zero. I also heard a group notice the difference between the arrows. Like in bond energies, you're looking at a process of breaking a bond, so your arrow's going up. In enthalpies of formation, right, you're forming something. Basically, you're taking your elements and you're forming the compound or a compound from the elemental form. So what a standard enthalpy of formation is, is it's the enthalpy change Right? In other words, the delta H for the reaction that produces, and this is important, one mole. of the compound from its elements. So it's the enthalpy change for the reaction that produces one mole of the compound from its elements in their most stable standard state. What does this, what do I mean by standard state? That just means if you're at 25 degrees Celsius and an atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere, whatever state the elements are in, for example, at 25 degrees in one atmosphere, carbon is not diamond. It takes higher pressure to form diamond, you're forming graphite. So graphite is the most stable if you're measuring under standard states. Okay, so this definition tends to confuse people. But essentially, if you look at this value, let's say you're looking at magnesium oxide and you read negative 601 kilojoules. What that's telling you is that if you started with magnesium solid and oxygen gas and you formed, you do the reaction that forms just one mole of magnesium oxide, and you, you did this reaction at 25 degrees and one atmosphere, you would get out negative 601 kilojoules of energy. Are there, I'm, I'm assuming there's questions. Are there questions about what this definition means? Not yet. Okay. Well, the last thing I want to point out is the fact that these are all negative, right? These negative heats of formation basically means that the compound formed is more stable. than the elemental form. Okay, so when you see a negative heat of formation, it means that the compound that you're forming is more stable, right?
And what other ideas do we associate with things being stable? There's a few links that I want you to know. More stable means what about potential energy? Did you say earlier that um, strong attraction means no potential energy, or is it the other way around? Yes, yeah, this means strong attractions. More stable, low potential energy. These are really important links. So if you see a negative heat of formation, it just means that there are stronger bonds in the compound that you formed it, as compared to the element. So when Marissa was pointing out that the ionic substances have really big heats of formation, it's because compared to the covalent bond that you would have in oxygen gas and the metallic bonds in metal magnesium, you have stronger attractions if you are forming the ionic substance. That's what that negative tells you. All right. So we're going to apply this to a particular context now. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Before yeah, please. I'll go back. Okay. Um, I don't know if I maybe just like heard it wrong when we first started, but so, so um, bond energies, separated atoms means no attraction and then no potential energy. Is that right? That's right. So the then, energy. Attraction means no potential energy or strong attraction means no potential energy? Say that again. So no attraction means there's like no potential energy at all. And yeah. then zero potential energy means strong attraction? I don't know, I'm just confused. Or like strong attraction means just that the, sense of the potential energy is just low? Just very low, very negative. Okay. So the signs really matter here. So in the bond energy scale, zero potential energy is when the atoms are totally separated. So you would imagine these two hydrogen atoms far apart and not attracting. Whereas when you make the bond, if you were to go this way, now you're gonna release 436 kilojoules of energy per, per mole of hydrogen formed, hydrogen gas formed. But the bond energy is measured in the up direction. It's breaking the strong attraction, putting energy in to separate things that are attracted to get to zero requires that positive 436. So that's a nice thing to know too about all of these values is when you flip the direction, you flip the sign. So if I'm going down, it's always negative, and if I'm going up, I'm always positive for my sign. Other questions? Oh, I had a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so for the standard enthalpies of formation, that chart over there, um, for the MgO solid in the iron oxide solid. Mm -hmm. um, you said those are high because they're ionic and they have strong attractions? Yeah. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Basically, whenever you see these negative numbers, it means that the substance that's getting formed, which is this, has much stronger attractions than the elemental forms of the elements that make up the substance. And I know that's probably a little confusing, but up here I'm just going to draw. So for MgO, magnesium oxide, you'd be looking at zero potential energy for magnesium solid and O2 gas because those are the elements that make up magnesium salt, magnesium oxide. Mm -hmm. 
negative 601. So this tells me that this ionic substance has strong attractions compared to the elemental form. So what's coming next is we're going to learn now part of the learning objectives that I talked about in the beginning was to be able to write the reaction equation for enthalpy of formations for any substance. So now I'm going to teach you how to do that. So this is kind of interesting. Um, when humans learned to, you know, use gold or silver or copper or lead or iron um, to make things, well, I will just say this table shows you how early on humans figured out how to use these metals. So people started to use gold 8,000 years before Christ, right? Negative 8,000 BCE. 2,000 years later, they figured out how to use silver. Around the same time, people started using copper. About 500 years later, people figured out how to use lead and iron wasn't until like 1,200 years after that. So I've given us the enthalpies of formation data. And ultimately what I want us to think about is why was it so, um, why was it easier to figure out how to use gold as opposed to let's say something like lead or iron? Um, to do that, I think it's helpful to draw energy diagrams. Um, but I also want to use this time to learn the steps for writing the equations for enthalpies of formation. So I'm going to walk us through the steps to write the equation, and then we'll draw the energy diagram. So this right here is gold oxide, gold three oxide. And if you want to write the enthalpy of formation equation, you need to remember that it's producing one mole of the compound from elements in their most stable state. So the first thing you should do is just write the substance as a product. Because this value is for making this substance from its elemental form. So draw your arrow, leave a little space in case you have to balance it. The next thing you got to do is ask yourself, what elements comprise the product? So we've got gold here and we've got oxygen. So now you have to think through, well, what form does gold exist in, in nature, in its most stable state? What kind of bonds does gold have? Metallic. Metallic. So it's going to be metallic, and is it going to be solid, liquid, or gas? Solid. Solid gold. And then oxygen, what is its state? O2. O2. Gas. Nice. Let me make my arrow. I try to leave room in front of each of them because then I have to balance it last. So remember that values in, that are reported in the tables are for producing only one mole of the compound. So you have to balance this equation so that there's only one mole of this getting created. So this has to be an invisible one. I'm just going to write it there for now. It'll help us balance. So what coefficients do I need on the reactant side such that there are two golds and three oxygens? 
a two on the gold, oh wait, a four on the gold and a six on the oxygen. I mean, not a six, three. Okay, we can start there. If we put a four and a three, that would, that would require that you put a two here. Do you see that? Because four gold, you'd have to have a two in front for it to be four. And three times two would be six. That's a good place to start. But now you're going to have to figure out how do you balance it such that there's only one mole of gold oxide formed. This has to be a one. Just half of them then. What, Paula? Just half of them. Two gold and 1.5 of oxygen. Ah, and fractions. So it's okay to use fractions when you're doing this. So two gold. And to get three here, I'd have to ask, what fraction do I multiply two by to get three? I want two to cancel in the denominator, so three halves oxygen. And now you know three halves of two gives you three. Does that make sense? So if you were gonna draw the energy diagram, you know now that the delta H of this reaction is positive 131. So that kind of bucks the trend. Because we saw that a lot of the ionic things that form are actually like very negative. They're stronger attractions. What does it mean to have a positive value for an enthalpy of formation? What would that mean about the stability of gold oxide? Not stable. It's not stable. Yeah, because if there's a positive, it means that the zero potential energy is my elements. So this is 2AU solid plus 3 halves O2 gas. And I got to put energy in if I want to make that product. I got to go up to positive 131 kilojoules if I want to make Au2O3. Is that making sense, folks? So that means this is less stable. than the elemental forms. Less stable than the elemental forms of gold and oxygen. Let's look at lead, lead oxide. Could you guys take a minute and um, write out what you think the enthalpy of formation equation is for lead oxide? And then underneath it, draw an energy diagram. Oh, and I see there's two questions in the chat, so I'm gonna look at that too. Got it. Um, I have a question. Yes, Marissa. Um, this elemental form of what what is that word elemental form of what it's that it's basically are you looking here yeah I can't really read it sorry gold au okay I'll just read out the words of gold and oxygen and I'll zoom in a little bit That's a little better. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. 
I was still copying down the uh, the H reacting for gold. Say that again. Um, oh, okay. There it is. I was just wondering where your screen went. <gasps> oh. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys need a little bit more time to work? A little. Thomas? Yeah. I actually got stuck in balancing the equation. Okay. Um, when you, in the products, I put them, um, you know, in their little natural state, like I did solid lead in O2 gas. And it forms the products of PPO. And I think you previously stated that you want the coefficient of the products to be one, but how would you do that in this case? You're gonna have to use fractions. So lead's okay, because there's one lead and one lead. But for oxygen, since there's two oxygens and you can only have one, you're gonna have to take half of this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we could think through what does the energy diagram look for this now, given that we know the change in enthalpy for this reaction is negative 217 kilojoule. Which is more stable? based on this delta H, the reactants or the products? The products. Products. So I'm gonna have to put PBO, solid, lower, and I'm, I know my elements are at zero. So PB solid plus one half O2 gas. And energy is getting released when I form lead oxide, negative 217 kilojoules of energy. So in this case, um, lead oxide is more stable. always make the more stable element or compound on the bottom of the chart. Say that again, Jasmine. You always write the more stable element or compound on the bottom of the chart. Yeah. Yeah, whatever has a bigger negative potential energy or a lower potential energy is more stable. So in this case, since the enthalpy reaction was positive, I knew I was starting at zero for the elements and then putting energy in to make gold oxide. Well, because this right here is negative, I know I'm starting at zero and energy is being released when I make lead oxide. Does that make sense? Um. So then think about the years here. 
Why did it take people so much longer to use lead to figure out how to get lead metal out of the earth as opposed to gold? Because it takes more energy to. You need more energy. What do you mean by that, Paula? Because, it, like, uh, when you're making bonds, you need to um, put out like energy. So, like, the more negative it becomes, the more kinetic energy that you need, and like, the lower the potential energy it gets. It's easier for um, for gold because it's more unstable than the lead. Yeah, so, so gold is more stable than gold oxide. So that would mean that in the earth, gold would exist as a pure metal. But because lead oxide is more stable than pure lead, you would have to put energy in, you'd have to go this direction to get to lead metal. So you'd have to put energy in to extract lead from lead oxide. So lead's going to exist in this ionic compound, not as lead metal, whereas gold is going to exist as gold metal because of its stability. And humans, Paul was talking about adding in kinetic energy, humans used fire. So in the early days, you could just use like regular old campfire if you wanted to extract silver. But as it took more and more energy to extract these metals, we needed um, ways to generate more heat. And it took time to figure out how to do that. And one thing that humans figured out is how to couple reactions. Okay, so iron, if you look, is the hardest to extract. Iron oxide is incredibly stable. If you want to go the other direction and get to iron metal, You got to put in a lot of energy, 824 kilojoules. So an alternative method was devised. As iron came into common use, scientists discovered processes to reduce the amount of energy required to extract iron. And one method involved adding carbon, carbon solid. So here was the reaction, if carbon, uh, was allowed to react with oxygen, it would make carbon dioxide. And the heat of formation of carbon dioxide, if you look back at our chart, if you were to make carbon dioxide from carbon solid and oxygen gas, you would get out a lot of energy. 394 kilojoules of energy would be released. So this negative delta H means this reaction is favorable. because it's exothermic. So what folks did is they would react iron oxide with carbon and the carbon would react with the oxygen in iron oxide making CO2 and that allows the iron to form pure iron metal. The question is though, when you couple this reaction here with the reaction of forming iron oxide, what is the delta H of this process now? So I'm going to talk through this one and then I'm going to give you another one to practice. So when I look 
at this, I'm noticing a few things. I'm noticing that carbon solid is, a, is pure carbon. So its enthalpy of formation is zero. And I'm noticing that iron is also a pure element, so its enthalpy of formation is zero. And then we know the enthalpy of formation for iron oxide and carbon dioxide because we can look them up in tables. Iron oxide and carbon dioxide. You never have to memorize, you'll always be given tables. So the question is, how do we use all of these values to figure out the delta H of this entire reaction? And I'm gonna start by drawing an energy diagram to help you conceptually understand, and then we'll derive a formula from that. So I'm just gonna put my reactant somewhere on my diagram, because I don't know yet if this whole thing is endo or exothermic. So I'm just gonna say, here are my reactants. Two moles of F, E2O3 solid plus three moles of carbon solid. Now, if I add together the enthalpies of the reaction, I could figure out how much energy it would take to get everything in its elemental form. So guys, what's the elemental form of iron? Solid. Solid. So we're going to write Fe solid, and we have to keep track of the stoichiometry. There's two moles of iron, and there's two iron ions in this unit. So i got to represent four iron solid. There's three oxygens in this unit and two units. So that's six oxygens total, but they're each O2 gas. So I'm gonna represent three molecules or three moles of molecules of O2. And then carbon solid is already in its elemental form. That's important to notice. So can you use the data in the table to figure out what this difference is? How much energy would be required to turn iron oxide into iron metal and oxygen gas? What might you have to do? What does this value mean? How do I interpret negative 824? It's the enthalpy chain for the reaction that makes one mole of iron oxide from the elements. So the eight, negative 824 is if you started with elements and you made the compound, negative 824 kilojoules of energy would be made if you only made one mole. So I can't say that this difference is 824 because oh, I'm making two moles. So 824 would only get me to here. Then I would need another 824 to get me to two moles. So what do I have to do? I'm going to say I'm starting or I'm trying to make two moles of Fe2O3. And the enthalpy of formation tells me that for every one mole 
824 kilojoules are required. Now, why did I change the sign? Why didn't I put negative here? I'm going up. You have to keep track of your directions. I'm going up to zero potential energy. So two moles, moles cancel. And two times 824 gives me 1684. Is that right? 1648. So I could think of the delta H for, let's say, the reactant. 1648 kilojoules. Now I want to know, okay, well how much energy will I get out when I form iron and CO2? Now to make iron, I don't have to do anything. I'm already there. I already have iron. So the question is, if I started with 3O2 and 3Cs, how much energy comes out when I make 3CO2? Well, I'd have to say, okay, I'm making three moles of CO2 on this down arrow. I don't know how long it is. Three moles CO2, and I'm going down, so I'm gonna keep it negative. I'm gonna get out 394 kilojoules of energy for every one mole of CO2 that reacts. Moles of CO2 cancel. When you multiply three by 394, you get negative 1,182 kilojoules of energy. That's basically the delta H for the products, making the products. Now question guys, just based on, I'm gonna write this in pink so that it's consistent. Based on the delta H of getting from the reactants to the element, and then going from elements to products, is this endothermic or exothermic? What are you asking yourself when you try to decide is this overall reaction endo or exothermic? What questions are coming up for people? The sign? The sign? Yeah, this is positive going up. This is negative going down. Which has a bigger magnitude, going up or going down? Going up. Going up, it's bigger. I have to put more energy in if I wanna take this iron oxide and make iron and oxygen. I get less energy out when I make carbon dioxide. So that tells me I did not leave enough room. I'm gonna erase this again. Erase, okay, you are amazing. Four Fe solid plus three CO2 gas. When I 
form that, we already said, you get out negative 1,182 kilojoules. So you're basically, if you want to find this difference, you're going up this time. This is the first endothermic reaction that we've seen. This red arrow represents the delta H of the whole reaction, which is what I was looking for here. So how do I decide what the delta H of the reaction is? I'm going to use the same process as I did for bond energies. I'm going to take this value, which is basically the heat of formation for the reactants, which is positive 1,648 kilojoules. And I'm going to add it to the delta H of formations for the products knowing that it's a negative number. So when I add 1,648 to 1,182, I get 466 kilojoules, positive. That makes sense because I'm going up. This is endothermic. This is 466 kilojoules. And we're talking about something that's endothermic. So back to the big picture, if you want to extract iron from iron oxide, you've got to put in 824 kilojoules. But if you couple the reaction with something that's favorable and exothermic, now if you want to get iron extracted, you only have to put in about half, 466 kilojoules, which is easier to do. It makes extracting iron um, possible. Is this making sense? The idea of how we drew this, of how we found the delta H using enthalpies of formation. So far, okay. Yeah. Right. Zach, question? No, I was saying it's uh, it's good. I, I think I understand it. Try this one. So for this, I'd like you to draw an energy diagram. And determine the delta H of reaction for this reaction. Silver reacts with iron oxide to make silver oxide and pure iron. You're given the heat of formation for silver oxide and for lead oxide. Notice they're both negative. I'm gonna send you into breakout rooms one more time. So maybe everyone could take a few minutes to work on it themselves and when they get somewhere, um, tell your group. 